Good afternoon, everyone. Very sorry to be late. Uh, I don't have anything to start with, so Matt. Cole. Well, after being so late, I don't want to delay your questions any further. So. Oh. <laughs> okay. So that means that you'll you'll promise us solid and. I'll promise solid you answer, answers. I'll promise you responses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, let me just start with uh, Ukraine and, and, and NATO. So the, the secretary is going to be meeting with um, for Mr. Kaleba tomorrow. Correct. 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 Um, President Zelensky is in town. Will be. Um, yeah. Um, what can you tell us in terms of what the U.S. is going to um, offer, or what the U.S. and others uh, in NATO are going to offer? So you will see a number of announcements come out of this summit. I won't get uh, too far ahead of them for obvious reasons, but you will see new military, diplomatic, uh, and economic support announced for Ukraine. You will see additional specificity, specificity about uh, Ukraine's bridge to NATO. Um, you will see additional announcements around significant air defense capabilities that allies will be providing to uh, Ukraine. And you will see us um, further talk about how we can better integrate Ukraine with NATO uh, while helping Ukraine take steps to advance towards membership. Can I, I, I I'm just a little bit confused. I, I mean, I, I guess I'm maybe not confused, but I, I don't really understand this bridge to NATO thing. This seems like it's like, you know, the, a roadmap. We've all seen the roadmaps to various things go into complete dead ends and not, 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 end, up, and not end up anywhere. Why is this bridge, how do, how do we know it's not a bridge to nowhere? So let me tell you exactly what it's a bridge to. Right now, Ukraine is well, not, I know in, what it's Ukraine is not in NATO. A, I, know, I know what it's supposed it, to be a bridge Ukraine's to. Ukraine's future I, I, is I, in NATO, and there will be a bridge to get from here to today. That will oh, yeah. well, um, include, it, well, you're going to have to wait to see the communique that comes out at the end of the week. I'm not going to get ahead of that, but it will include um, uh, the steps that, um, the alliance is prepared to take and that Ukraine needs to take as well to uh, move along that bridge to full membership. To move along. So the, along the, bridge, so the bridge actually exists already? It's uh, not yet, it's not still under construction? Uh, you can, I, I, you can mean, torture I, this metaphor I'm many, not, many I, different I, ways. You but guys I've are been, the ones who came up with it, I, not I, me. I know, I try not to torture it. No, the, but I, I'm not trying to be cute. The point is, the idea of a bridge is to get them from where they are today, which is a country that has received significant is. support from, from <laughs> NATO, to membership. And you will see further details about that uh, announced during this summit, but I'm obviously not going to detail them here. Yeah, but, you know, back in Bucharest, you know, more than a decade ago, the idea was that they were going to get into, that they were going to get into uh, to NATO and and and... and so what's, I don't, so I don't, I don't understand, how is this bridge any different than the promises that have been made to them in the past? So you will see specific steps outlined uh, in the communique, we expect, about Ukraine's path towards NATO. Now, it's a little bit hard for me to answer the question here because I can't tell you what those steps are going to be, what's going to be contained in the communique, because I can't get ahead of an announcement that's coming later in the week, but um, you will see... A significant new announcement, and I'm happy to have the conversation right. in detail after we have made that announcement public. Several, several times your colleague at the White House said that NATO is going to be in Ukraine's future. Uh, he said that uh, several times. It seemed to be kind of a, a talking point. Um, so can I turn it around? Uh, can you say this? Is it equally the case that Ukraine will be part of, uh, or that Ukraine is going to be in NATO's future? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank We've you. been quite clear that you that I mean you've heard the president say that Ukraine will be in NATO. Well, I was just wondering about yeah. that specific wording. Yeah. John. Uh, sure. I follow up a couple of things on Ukraine. Um, I know uh, Kirby was asked about this a little bit, but more indirectly, the um, the the attack today or the the uh, the, the explosion at the, the hospital, the children's hospital. <laughs> Can you say anything about that? Um, the, I believe uh, Zelensky has declared a, a day of mourning. The Russians are saying that they think that it was Ukrainian air, air defense systems. Uh, are you sure that this was a, a Russian attack? And if so, do you have any comment on that? Yes, uh, we are sure it was a Russian attack. We've seen Russia unleash, an, uh, unleash another savage missile attack, hitting civilians in Kyiv uh, and other cities across Ukraine. Uh, we are seeing reports that at least 23 civilians were killed in Ukraine uh, in these missiles attacks. Um, just to be clear, these are sites that serve no military purpose. 
Um, they're not sheltering Ukrainian military assets. They're not sheltering U members of the Ukrainian military. These are civilian infrastructure, pure and simple, that cannot, should not, must not be targets of military attacks. But once again, we've seen uh, uh, Putin deliberately attacking civilian infrastructure as part of his bloody war against Ukraine. And so you think it's, it's I mean, I guess you can't get in his head, but you think it's deliberate. It wasn't a, a mistake in a, a target. So it's hard to say with any one particular strike, but when you look at the history of Russia continuously targeting civilian infrastructure that bears no legitimate military purpose, uh, then it's hard to conclude it's anything but deliberate. This isn't just one strike. There are, is a pattern of strikes, as I said, where there is no uh, there are no Ukrainian forces, there are no Ukrainian military assets, and yet you see the Russian uh, military continue to strike them time after time. Uh, could I follow up on Ukraine and some of the diplomacy? Yeah. Um, uh, the Hungarian prime minister was uh, recently in, in, in Kiev and Moscow and Beijing. Uh, do you find anything productive about this? Uh, what's, what's your take on No, not at all. We find it concerning, in fact. Look, uh, before he traveled to Russia, you did see the Hungarian prime minister travel to Ukraine. We thought that was an important thing for him to do. We thought that was a productive step. Uh, and we would welcome, of course, actual diplomacy with Russia to make it clear to Russia that they need to respect Ukraine's sovereignty, that they need to respect Ukraine's territorial integrity. But that is not at all what this visit appears to have been. Um could I follow up on one more? The um, there is another visitor in Moscow today, uh, Prime Minister Modi of India. Uh, I, you know, obviously okay. India has a long-standing relationship with Russia. What do you think of the timing of this, right before the NATO summit, and in light of what's going on? Yeah. Ukraine? So again, we did just see Modi, um, uh, like Orban, meet with President Zelensky. We thought that was an important uh, step to take, um, and we would urge India, as we do any country when it engages engages with Russia, to make clear that uh, any. <laughs> Resolution to the conflict in Ukraine needs to be one that respects the UN Charter, that respects Ukraine's um, territorial integrity, Ukraine's sovereignty. And, you know, you, India is a strategic partner with whom we engage in a full and frank dialogue, and that includes uh, on our concerns about the relationship with Russia. Sorry, Was it? Sorry, I, I, don't, I don't understand your answer to the Orban question. I mean, it's okay and it's good and productive for him to go to see Zelensky in Kiev, but it's concerning and bad that he goes. Because what to I Putin just what G. I just, is it only the timing? What I, no. because there are plenty of if you people listen, who if, have been go going. If you listen to the answer that I that to my full answer, it's we welcome people engaging with Russia about the war in Ukraine, if they make clear to Russia that Russia needs to respect Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty, and that goes to the fact that. There is a difference between Ukraine and Russia, and there's a difference between engaging with Ukraine and Russia because one side is the aggressor and one side's the victim. So, of course, they're, we look at their engagement with those two countries differently. Well, yeah, but okay, so are, are you, do you know for sure that he didn't uh, I, make I, those things clear? We have seen no indication that that is, um, uh, including his public statements, that that, that, that is And do you that think that Prime clear. Minister Modi made clear to um, President Putin? And, uh, as that? I just said, we. Do you think that. So, so President I will, Erdogan has made clear. To so I will I will look to um, Prime Minister Modi's public remarks to, to see what he talked about. But as I said, we made quite clear um, directly with India our concerns about their relationship with Russia. And so we would hope India and any other country when they engage with Russia uh, would make clear that Russia should respect the UN Charter, should respect Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And, and what's the problem with, with Orban going to, uh, to Xi Jinping? I didn't, I wasn't asked about that. I was, well, asked, about, I I was asked about. I was asked about. I was asked about. Were asked about that. Oh, I, I missed. I missed that. I missed that part of the question. No, I was, I was, weren't. Didn't, was not part of your question. Yeah, but I was asking. Was I didn't. I, I, I totally missed the sheep part. I was talking about. So uh, there's no. You, so you don't have a problem with. I don't have any comment. Sheep. We understand that that countries okay. um, uh, engage with China. We, as you know, Secretary Blinken has traveled to China twice. Yes. Now, President Xi. Yes. Yes. Just, just follow up briefly yeah. on the on the, uh, the Modi part of that. He said that you've you, that the U.S. Has, has dialogue with India about concerns about the relationship with Russia. Were the concerns expressed prior to Modi's visit, and has there been any dialogue before that? Uh, before we visit? have we have long made clear those those concerns. I mean, specifically about the trip to Moscow. I'm not aware of any conversation specifically about this trip in advance of the trip. Um, just while we're on the topic of Russia, are you expecting any other provocative actions from Russia this week, given the 75th anniversary of NATO, the gathering in Washington this week? You know, it's very hard to say because it's not like this strike against civilian infrastructure today came out of the blue. It's not like the, this is the first time that they have done this. So 
Uh, it's hard to know whether this strike was timed to the NATO summit or not, because we've seen strikes from Russia against civilian infrastructure that have killed scores of civilians in previous weeks. So uh, I don't know how to answer that question other than that this fits a pattern that we have seen from uh, Russia going back to the outset of this conflict. So I certainly expect that these sorts of strikes would continue, whether or not they will come this week, whether or not they're related to the NATO summit, I think it's impossible to say. And any indication that there's plans for a change to their nuclear posture or their nuclear doctrine this week? No, we have seen no indications of that. Okay. Um, and if if we could just stick on, um, on NATO for a minute here, um, Kirby said, you know, Ukraine is in NATO's future or whatever way it was. Um, and I wonder if it's still the position, though, of this administration that the war has to be over before Ukraine can join NATO. Otherwise, that would draw the entire alliance into the conflict. So I just don't want to get too much into the details of what uh, Ukraine's membership in NATO will look like and what steps they have to take to get there. Today, in advance of significant new announcements being made in that regard over the course of this week. So uh, I know that sounds a little bit like a punt, but in fact, it's because we will be making new announcements with respect to these very questions this week, and I don't think I should get ahead of them today. There are specific I mean, yeah. announcements you're going to make having to do with about the, the about, timing of the about, war about and the, when Ukraine will join NATO? About their bridge to NATO, and I don't want to talk about it any further before we can make those announcements and you can all look at them and then of course we'll be happy to take questions about them sure. and talk, and, uh, talk okay. about them further. And, and then last question on NATO. Um, on Wednesday night there is the leader level dinner that is being hosted by the president and the first lady. It starts at 6 p.m. over the weekend President Biden told governors would gather that he's not going to go to any events after 8 p.m. try and get some rest given um, some of his challenges with his age. So is there a plan for the Secretary of State to stay if that event goes on longer past 8 p.m., or will the president uh, stay on past 8 p.m.? So I won't speak to the president's schedule. I'll let the White House do that. But I would say with respect to his schedule, I think this NATO summit will look a lot like previous NATO summits where the president and other members of our government, the Secretary of State, but also the Secretary of Defense and other uh, leaders in the government will have a full schedule of events starting in the morning and going through the evening. That includes bilateral meetings, includes multilateral meetings. Uh, the secretary will participate in those with respect to any one event. Um, uh, several days from now, I'm not, I can't tell you um, uh, what his participation will be at that dinner, and when it comes to the president, uh, the, certain, the White House can, can speak to that. Well, to be fair, the Vilnius summit, it was the secretary who went to that dinner instead of the president. Right, but with this one, um, uh, I'm going to let the White House speak to what the president's exact schedule is. Sure. I just don't know. Yeah. Um, just to follow up on the, the comments you gave about um, this strike in, in Kiev and in, in the hospital, obviously this has happened very quick, very um, only a few hours ago. Could you talk us through how you're able to come to those kind of uh, solid conclusions about, you know, this is a Russian, this is a Russian attack. We've, we've seen the, this pattern. We see it fits the pattern. In, that, in this case, what is the process for you to be able to sort of state with, with, with so much kind of confidence what, what's happening? Well, so I could get into our ability to look at missiles that are launched. I could get into the Ukrainian military's ability to look at missiles that are launched and um, talk about that with respect to any one strike. But also, give me a break. There's no one else lobbying missiles at Ukraine right now. Right. There's no one else launching attacks at Ukraine. Um, so I think it's pretty clear that it came yeah. from Russia. But you probably can guess what I'm getting at is, you know, in the other situation that we're often talking about in Gaza, when there are strikes, there have been there have been strikes that have hit hospitals, other facilities, universities. In in those cases, and often, and in some cases, you know, U.S. weapons are actually involved in those strikes. But you've been un pretty unable in a lot of those cases to say definitively what happened. Uh, you know, why why the disparity there among about your sort of information gathering? So the disparity is in the context of the events, uh, and I'll give you just a couple of examples when it comes to Gaza. What makes these types of assessments uh, so hard? Uh, oftentimes, it is clear that um, a strike on any one target was an Israeli strike. If it's an airstrike, for example, it's clear that it was an Israeli strike. It's not from any anyone else. Uh, sometimes there are other uh, attacks where there's an exchange of fire between Hamas and the IDF, and it's clear, or it's unclear, I should say, 
when one specific site was damaged, whether that damage was from, from IDF munitions, Hamas munitions, or both, which sometimes happens in a crossfire. That's one way in which it's difficult. The other way in which it's difficult is understanding what the actual target was. And so that's one of the things that's different when you look at Russia's strikes on Ukraine. The Ukrainian military doesn't hide behind civilians. It's not headquartering itself in hospitals, under hospitals, uh, in other civilian sites, in apartment buildings. And that's exactly what we see Hamas do. And so when you get to uh, making assessments about strikes in Gaza, it's not just always who conducted the strike, but whether the strike ultimately was after a legitimate military target or not. And it's a much different assessment in Gaza where you have Hamas using civilians as human shields, which is not at all the case in Ukraine. All right, but you, you did you did sort of say that it seems that that this isn't a, an accidental strike aimed at something else. That's quite you know there's quite a lot of information that you've, you're able to to, to to sort of pass on there. There have been cases where you know I'm I'm obviously not defending the Russian strikes, but there there are cases where Ukrainian anti-aircraft fire has taken down a missile and it hits something. Right, there are there is complexity to that. But you're able to, you know, a few hours later, give a pretty detailed uh, account of what happened. I'm not saying that I'm, 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 I'll give you a break on that. That's, that's, that's your job. But on the Israeli case, often, you know, we're, we're left with uh, after months, you know, you haven't got uh, come up with a, a, a real conclusion about what happened in a certain specific incident that, you know, and, th and these are these are U.S. weapons that are being used. You have the ability to sort of demand answers from the country involved. So I think people will, will watch this and think, you know, there's a disparity here. And, and I, I'm wondering, you know, is, is there not a, a difference in the way that you're approaching these and giving the benefit of the doubt to one side? There is no difference in how we are approaching these. There's a difference in the context. There's a difference in the conflict. And that what that's what uh, lends itself, that's what leads to our inability sometimes to give such definitive answers. I will also say that there is a difference in assessing responsibility for a strike, right? Which is what I was getting into a moment uh, ago, and assessing whether the strike was a legitimate military target. Those are two entirely separate things. Sometimes you can make an assessment about who carried out the strike, but you can't know unless you were on the ground whether it was a legitimate military target. And that's especially the case where we often see conflicting claims uh, uh, in Gaza, which is not the case in Ukraine. I haven't heard any conflicting claims about what happened in Ukraine uh, and what they were trying, what Russia might have been trying to hit if it was not this hospital, if it was not the uh, other civilian infrastructure that they have hit. And I've seen no claims from Russia that there were uh, legitimate military targets embedded in this civilian infrastructure. That is often the case in Gaza, where you get conflicting claims, where you have reports from the ground that there were no Hamas fighters there, and you have the IDF claiming that it took out a number of Hamas fighters. When you have those conflicting claims, that often makes it hard to offer definitive conclusions for I th what I would hope are fairly obvious reasons. Can I say uh, I'll go to Saeed first. I'll, I'll, I'll come to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, first uh, if you read or heard about the Haaretz report on uh, Israel employing the Hannibal directive on October 7th? Uh, so I did see that report that moved over the weekend, and that's that's the right. limit of my knowledge of seeing that report from Haaretz. Does that make you change your your position or your perspective on what really happened that day, that the Israelis may be responsible for killing a majority of the people that died on that day? Boy, it certainly does not, Saeed. Does I, don't okay. I, I, I don't think there's any question. I don't think there's any question that right. that it was Hamas. Just let me finish. I don't think it's any question it's Hamas that is responsible for uh, the overwhelming number of deaths right. uh, on okay. October 7th. All right. Now, you and your answer to Simon, you, you gave two answers. You, you, you were saying that, you know, almost with certainty that um, people were, were killed in the crossfire. Do you have any figure on how many people got killed in the crossfire? No. Or how many people that died uh, as a result of direct Israeli attacks? No, I don't, but that's exactly my point, Saeed. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you, the, the best example of this is the recent hostage rescue when a number of people in the area who were not members of Hamas were killed in crossfire. And that happened when Israeli vehicles with a hostage on board were leaving the area, took fire from Hamas, and then there was exchange of fire. Um, and that's something that happens from time to time. 300 people died that day, but at, at any rate, so 
uh, let me ask you, what is the status of the negotiation now? Is there, I mean, is there a ceasefire in Gaza's future? In your, in your, uh, we uh, certainly hope, hope there's a ceasefire in Gaza's future, and we are trying incredibly hard to achieve a ceasefire. The negotiations are ongoing. The CI director is in Cairo today working uh, on those negotiations. As we said last week when we received a, a response from Hamas, we found reasons to be hopeful. Uh, in that response, but that said, we don't yet have a deal, and we're not taking anything in granted unless and until we get a deal. And so we continue to work to try to achieve a ceasefire that would secure the release of hostages, would allow us uh, to surge humanitarian assistance in and alleviate the suffering of the Palestinian people. So you believe that the Israeli prime minister is okay with this new proposal? He has said he is, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, well, well, let, me, let, me, let me just be correct. I, not, not, I, I, I want to make sure I'm not misunderstood. I don't mean that in that he has endorsed the proposal has come back from Hamas. Um, right. He has endorsed the proposal that the Israeli government put forward, and we're working to bridge the differences between Hamas's response and what the Israeli government puts forward sometime before, so is, you, several you, weeks ago. You think this is a bridge too far? I'm not going to negotiate on this in public. All right. Let me let me ask you a couple of things. I mean, you know, we see Israel, uh, Rafah is completely destroyed and people uh, are dying. Israel is just uh, grabbing land in the West Bank. It's really doing a lot of things. Would you be agreeable to any other state doing what Israel has done, let's say, in the past 48 hours or the past 72 hours or the past week and so on against Palestinians, whether in Gaza or in the West Bank? I mean, would, wouldn't you be outraged? I mean, we hear reports by Israeli soldiers themselves. They're saying they were killing children because they were bored. So out loud. L let yeah. me take those one at a time. When it comes to abuses uh, by the IDF, we make very clear <laughs> that we expect the IDF to have full accountability for any soldier uh, that behaves inappropriately, that violates either uh, IDF rules of engagement or the laws of war. And we have seen the IDF announce that they will take steps to impose such accountability, and we will watching that, be watching that very closely. When it comes to settlements, we have also made clear that we oppose this, the advancement of settlements in the West Bank. We think that they are uh, both inconsistent with international law and that they are ultimately counterproductive to uh, the real, realization of peace, which is in Israel's interest. And that includes uh, urging Israeli officials to not take actions to fund outposts that have long been illegal under Israeli law. So we will continue to make that clear. So any particular response to what happened last week in terms of the size? of land confiscated by Israel for settlement purposes, which is apparently the largest since the, you know, the 1967 war, since 19, definitely since the Oslo Accord in 1993. Have any particular comment on that? Yeah, as I, ju I just said, we oppose the advancement of, of, of settlements. We oppose them taking actions to fund uh, outposts. Um, uh, we think all of those are inter illegal under international law and ultimately uh, hurt the chances of peace. Can I just follow up on yeah. the third point that Saeed was making about ceasefire? Because uh, there was a list of principles. Uh, the Israeli Prime Minister, Mr. Netanyahu, uh, his office issued yesterday on the ceasefire, one of which appeared to be uh, a desire, or he said, insisting on uh, resuming fighting until all the objectives of the war have been achieved. I mean, we know that one of his objectives is the complete destruction of Hamas, not just his military existence, but also its administrative um, uh, and governance capabilities and so on, which goes way beyond what uh, the president announced in his May um, uh, framework that was described as the Israeli proposal. So have you got any reaction to what he said yesterday? So uh, I don't know that this will be a satisfying answer, but I think it's most productive to hold these negotiations in private. But not the, in public. Yeah, but it wasn't. I, I, well, no, but this, the president this, Tom, made a Tom, very public Tom, let me, announcement. Let me, about. Just hold on. Just let me finish. Tom. <laughs> uh, if I'm happy to answer the question, you can ask me a follow up if you want. Um, we think it is productive to have these conversations in private, not in public. Sometimes seeing the Israeli government make public statements, we've seen Hamas make public statements. Um, we're going to hold the negotiations in private, and what has not changed is Israel is in its conversations with us, saying that they are committed to the proposal that the president publicly outlined. I'm just, I mean, the reason I'm, I was pushing back on that is it was a very public announcement by the president about, in what, some detail, about what should be in this proposal. And we have a very public announcement by the Israeli prime minister about what he believes. Um, so this isn't, I'm not asking you to negotiate in public. I'm just asking for 
whether you believe this is a shift in the Israeli position or is this something that Mr. Netanyahu is simply saying for We do not reasons? believe that their substantive position has changed. They have uh, consistently supported the, the, position, the proposal that they put forward several weeks ago that the president outlined publicly. So do you think he's saying this for domestic consumption and uh, he doesn't actually mean it? I'm just not going to characterize it at all. Um, yeah, go ahead. I promise you. Um, the, the United Nations warned of widespread starvation in Gaza all the way back in December. We've had aid organizations and relief groups who've said over and over again that Israel is using starvation as a tactic of war. You've had 12 US government employees who've resigned. And they accuse the US government of undeniable complicity in the starvation of Palestinians. Doctors we've spoken to at Al Jazeera have told us that they, in part, also blame the US government for the horrors that they are seeing. How do you respond to the allegations of complicity of the US government and what more will it take for the US to stop Israeli military funding? So let me just say, let me just take the humanitarian assistance piece uh, first, because you raised that uh, in the introduction to your question. So is the United States that has secured all of the major agreements to get more humanitarian assistance into Gaza. Going back to the very early days, the first week after October 7th, when the secretary traveled to the region and the president traveled to, to Israel, and together convinced Israel to open Rafa crossing to allow humanitarian assistance in. It is the United States that worked to deliver, that worked to open Karim Shalom to get humanitarian assistance in, to open Erez Gate in the north. It is the United States that has worked day and night in the region, in Washington, in other capitals uh, around the world to coordinate a humanitarian assistance effort to get uh, uh, food and water and medicine to the Palestinian people. It has not been enough. There are obstacles. Um, sometimes those are logistical obstacles coming from Israel. Sometimes those are uh, the nature of moving humanitarian assistance around in an armed conflict. But when you look at what has actually happened, the sad truth is there is widespread food insecurity in Gaza, and we have worked to try and address that. But when you saw the IPC, the group that actually measures famine, come out and make assessments, they warned that famine was imminent. We worked hard to get gates open and get more humanitarian assistance in. In their last uh, assessment, which came out after the time they predicted famine uh, was going to occur, uh, uh, they came out and assessed that it had not yet happened, which is not at all to say that the conditions are good. Of course they're not. They remain dire for the, humani for the, the population in Gaza. But we continue to work to get humanitarian assistance in and will continue to do so. I cannot tell you the amount of work that the secretary has put into this, that the president has put into this, that others in the uh, government have put into this, um, and will continue to put into it. And that's not to mention the ceasefire agreement that we are trying to broker, which would allow a massive surge in humanitarian assistance and would allow humanitarian assistance to move more freely uh, around Gaza. So when it comes to our policy for getting humanitarian assistance it, uh, into Gaza and to the people who need it, um, we're not gonna change one bit. Just we're gonna continue, oh, no, just let me, let me finish. We're gonna continue to work day and night to get humanitarian assistance and recognizing all the barriers um, working to try to overcome them. And every time we do, something else pops up and we work to overcome that too. And that's what we're going to continue to do. So just to follow up on that, but the latest IPC report actually says that 96% of the population of Gaza is facing acute food insecurity which is what I just said. level or higher. Dire. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's still very dire. And you've spoken about what the U.S. has done, but the U.S. also continues to be the biggest funder of Israeli military. And under U.S. law, it is required that any country receiving military support must, up, must not obstruct the flow of humanitarian aid during war on every major rights group, from the United Nations to Human Rights Watch, has said that Israel is using starvation as a tactic of war. Do you disagree with them? So, uh, and are you just, sorry, one yeah. final question. Are you not afraid of completely losing legitimacy? As so being let, me, seen, let me just answer that. Let me, when it comes let me just answer. Supporting human yeah. rights in one country, let me just but answer. not when it comes to Palestinians. Let me just answer the first question. So I would encourage you to read the report that we issued on this very question two months ago that looked into uh, Israel's compliance with international humanitarian law and their work uh, uh, and whether they had done a good enough job to let humanitarian assistance in, where we said uh, that there were some roadblocks that needed to be overcome and we had worked to overcome those and we had seen Israel uh, take steps to allow humanitarian assistance in. At times they have been too slow. 
out. Uh, at times they haven't moved quickly enough. At times there have been barriers that we need to break down, but we have worked to do it. And we have seen Israel take steps to allow humanitarian uh, assistance in. Now, there is all, as I just said a moment ago, there is always something more that needs to be done. We've talked about the fact that you have a lot of assistance coming to Karim Shalom now, but it can't move around uh, Gaza as freely as it could because of looting by armed gangs. And so we need to come up with practical steps uh, to address that. And I say that to get at the point that I know sometimes everyone likes to make this seem like a black and white issue um, that is completely simple, where there's somebody that's blocking humanitarian assistance, when it actually, it can be much more complex. Uh, there can be, other, there can be uh, other problems, such as the looting of criminal gangs that we have to assess, and so we're working with our partners in the region to try to assess that, and we're going well, to continue to, to, to work to do that. So I have to reply to that, sir. I just have to quickly reply to that. Sorry, can I just quickly reply to that point? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, no, reply. thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, on NATO subject, uh, Secretary Blinken recently said that uh, it would be dangerous for Asia-Pacific countries such as South Korea and Japan to ignore Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So solidarity with NATO will have a strong synergy effect. Do you think NATO allies, including South Korea, Japan, will reach an agreement on a new security treaty at this NATO summit? So I just don't want to preview any type of the announcements that will come out uh, over the course of the summit. A second question. Uh, President Xi Jinping and the Russian President Putin recently met at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization conference. And the president to work together to fight competition with the United States. And Xi Jinping mentioned that the conclusion of the treaty between North Korea and Russia was reasonable as a sovereignty country. How can you react to this? Um, to repeat the last sentence of the question again, just just, just, just the, la the, la the very end of the question. Just the second one. Yeah, just the end, not the time. I just missed. The, I missed the yeah, last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Putin recently met at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization conference, and the president to work together to right. fight competition with the United States. And uh, Xi Jinping mentioned that the conclusion of the treaty between North Korea and Russia was reasonable as a sovereign countries. How do you react? I think we have made quite clear our great concern about increased collaboration <laughs> between uh, the DPRK and Russia. We've seen um, Russia supporting, I'm sorry, the DPRK supporting uh, Russia's war machine that is targeting and killing innocent civilians in Ukraine um, and violating the territorial integrity and sovereignty of another United Nations member in violation of the multiple uh, United Nations Security Council resolutions. And we will continue to work with our allies and partners to uh, counter that relationship. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. A couple of questions about uh, today's hospitality. But before that, uh, the metaphor that you're using, uh, the bridge, uh, just to understand you know, how far you're willing to go, how is it going to be different from last year? Look, every bridge starts You know you can a, torture a metaphor to death no, sometimes. No, just, so just to understand, every bridge starts with a blueprint. Does that mean that the Biden administration has I'm a clear strategy, a plan for Ukraine to become a member of NATO? Uh, I'm going to answer this question the way I did uh, 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 some of the others, which is you should not expect me to speak in detail about announcements that will be made by the president and other heads of state later this week at the NATO summit. So um, uh, you will hear concrete announcements from the NATO heads of state in the summit about what that bridge looks like. And as frustrating as I know it is on Monday when we have this uh, summit starting uh, over the next couple of days, I'm just not going to get ahead of it here. Fair enough. A couple of questions on, on the hospital attack. You said that it's clear that it came from Russia. You said uh, it is deliberate. Uh, you stopped short saying that it's a terror attack, because that's what you described. So isn't, isn't it an act of terrorism? Uh, it is uh, a deliberate targeting of, of innocent civilians, uh, is our judgment. Um, I know you're going with the, the question. Our position on designation of state sponsor of terrorism has not changed. Uh, the, the fact that this was conducted by the current chair of UN Security Council, how are you digesting that? 
how are we digesting it? Mm -hmm. I mean, that doesn't really have anything to do with it. Uh, Russia is a, a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Obviously, um, they become the chair uh, on a regular basis of the UN Security Council. That doesn't change in any in any way. Um, uh, the horrific nature of their actions, and of course, it doesn't give legitimacy to them uh, at all. And give you today's attack, would the Biden administration be willing to allow Ukraine to hit back anywhere with any weapons at uh, any time uh, by using American? I don't have any change uh, to our uh, policy to announce. Uh, can we come back to more Georgia, if possible, later? Yeah. Okay, so Iran. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the new president, uh, president elect of Iran, uh, Bezash Kulan, uh, he said in some of his first remarks that he wants to. Um, I mean, the tone is very different from his predecessor, saying he wants to reach out to the U.S. or to the to the West and have a better relationship. Uh, how does the U.S. see that? I mean, is there? I mean, this administration obviously at the beginning wanted to restore the JCPOA. Could that? Could there be a return to that? So we have no expectations that this election will lead to a fundamental change in Iran's direction uh, or uh, its policies. At the end of the day, it's not the president that uh, has the ultimate say over the future of Iran's policy. It is the supreme leader. Uh, and of course, we have seen the direction that he has chosen to take uh, Iran in. Uh, obviously, if the new president had the authority to make steps to um, curtail Iran's nuclear program, to stop funding terrorism, uh, to stop destabilizing activities in the region, those would be steps that we would welcome. Um, but uh, needless to say, we don't have any expectation that that's what's likely to ensue. Okay, no expectations. Does, does that mean you're willing to try them out to see if, uh, if would you be open to uh, to testing the waters with, with the new uh, president? So uh, let's let him take office first. I don't have anything to, to announce today. We have always said that um, diplomacy is the most effective way to achieve an effective, sustainable solution uh, with regard to Iran's nuclear program, uh, one of the issues with which we have great concerns, obviously, and nothing about the election has changed that. Um, but we have also made clear that we are far from any kind of meaningful diplomatic uh, resolution right now, given Iran's escalation across the board. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you have a comment on uh, China in uh, Belarus right now doing joint military drills uh, just ahead of the NATO summit? Let me take that one back and get you an answer. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Matt. A question on Turkish military operation in Iraq and Kurdistan region. Turkey has advanced nine miles deep into the Kurdistan region territory and carried out more than 1,000 strikes so far this year, uh, and including today they attacked uh, three people in Shanghai. Do you agree the way Turkey is dealing with the situation in Kurdistan region in fighting PKK? And the second one, uh, this conflict has a huge impact on the villagers and the civilian people and a wider impact on the region. Has the United States ever reached Ankara, Baghdad, Erbil to come over the situation and dealing with that situation? So we have urged the government of Turkey to coordinate with uh, Iraqi and IKR authorities on cross-border military operations and to protect civilians from harm. Uh, we also recognize the ongoing threat posed by the PPK and um, uh, but that said, we call on the Turkish government to coordinate military operations with the governments of Iraq, Kurdish regional government, and other local authorities. And do you agree with the Turkish operation in the Kurdistan region to fight? Uh, I just don't have any comment because other than the one that I just made. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> going back to the missile uh, attacks. So, Polish uh, Prime Minister Donald Tusk, uh, in his meeting with uh, President Zelensky today, said that he wants to be able to shoot down Russian missiles that are going in the direction of Poland and do it over the Ukrainian airspace. But he said that he would need an agreement from NATO or from the, some other international body. Do you think is, the, uh, is, is that an idea that's worth you know discussing or do you think? I, I don't have, so I don't have any changes when it comes to either U.S. policy or NATO policy to announce today, um, but obviously any time uh, uh, a NATO member wants to raise a policy, they have the ability to do so and discuss it with other heads of state. They'll have a summit this week, and uh, I'm sure that is something that could be discussed if, the, uh, if he would like to do so. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you have an update? It's on uh, the uh, political or diplomatic solution that the U.S. is working on mm -hmm. between Israel and Hezbollah, especially after the visit that uh, Mr. Hochstein made last week to Paris? So the answer that really does come back to an answer I gave in response to, I don't know whose question it was, about the ceasefire negotiations. Uh, we have 
been taking further diplomatic steps to try and reduce tensions uh, along the border between uh, Israel and Lebanon and try to set the table for a lasting ceasefire. But again, we think we are much more likely to have success in that endeavor if we are able to get a ceasefire in Gaza. And so uh, we continue to work. As I said, we have the CIA director in the region now in Cairo uh, working on talks to achieve a ceasefire. We're pursuing those full bore. Um, doesn't mean the work stops on trying to, to achieve a climb down along the Israel Lebanon border, but it's just very, it's just much more difficult without getting a ceasefire in Gaza first. And one more on the death of uh, President Assad's uh, advisor uh, uh, this week or last week. Do you I, have any? No, I don't have any comment on it at all. Yeah. Um, I wanted to come back to the humanitarian situation in Gaza, given yeah. some of your answers earlier. That you mentioned the IPC report. So one of the things that that report said was that the the, a lot of the progress that Israel that had made, been made after you kind of gave this ultimatum to the Israelis about about opening new gates and things had actually been reversed by the Israeli operation in Rafa. Um, you know there was a lot of talk about that operation in Rafa. Uh, you know a, main, a major operation in Rafa shouldn't go ahead. Um, some kind of operation did go did go ahead. You haven't said it's a major operation and foreign journalists have been taken there by the Israelis for the first time. I think a lot of people have seen the images, do you still stick with this this assessment that this wasn't a major operation given some of the destruction, you know, noting that these journalists were taken in by the Israelis so they were only able to see what the Israelis wanted them to see and if you see the footage it looks, you know, pretty devastating. Let me, let me just say something about the humanitarian si situation first before I get to that. So yeah. without a doubt the situation remains incredibly challenging. Uh, and some of the metrics have gone down since, say, six weeks ago when we were getting a much steadier flow in through a, uh, a number of different challenges. Uh, a big reason for that, as I said, is the just lawlessness uh, outside of Karim Shalom in southern Gaza that has made it very difficult to deliver humanitarian assistance uh, around. So it's just this, it's this really frustrating problem where you address one challenge, you get enough humanitarian assistance to the gate, uh, which for a while was part of the problem, and then you have a, a difficulty moving it beyond the gate into um, uh, Gaza. The point I was making is that um, we had gotten the situation somewhat stabilized. It had stopped getting worse, and we were at the point where we were trying to make it better, and we continue to try to make it better, and that is an ongoing challenge that we're all working hard on. Um, when it comes to Rafa, no, nothing has changed. We, what, what we made clear is we did not want to see the type of military operation that looked like the military operations we saw in Gaza City, we saw in uh, Khan Yunus, where you had mass civilian casualties. You had, uh, in some neighborhoods, almost complete and total destruction. And the Rafa operation has looked different, which is not to say at all that there has not been destruction. Of course there has. There have been uh, uh, a great number of homes and other uh, facilities that have been uh, destroyed. The damage in Rafa does not appear to be as great, and we'll have a, you know, there'll be assessments of this over time, but it does not appear to be as great as those in Khan Yunus and those in Gaza City. And notably, the civilian harm has been reduced uh, in operations. If you just look at the number of civilian casualties, uh, actually, I should say the number of casualties, because it's often when you get the number from the Gaza Health Ministry, it's impossible to, oftentimes to differentiate between civilians uh, and militants. The casualty number has come down dramatically um, over the past few months, which isn't to say there, are, uh, there aren't still civilians being killed. There are, and any number is unacceptable. We want to see that number go to zero. But the operation has, just in terms of the results, looked different than the operations in Gaza City and Khan Yunus. All that said, we want to get a ceasefire so we see an end to the death and destruction in Rafah and elsewhere. Uh, in Gaza. Wouldn't, I mean, I think a lot of people would say the way that you you gave a very strong warning, a very clear warning, you know, don't go into Rafa. Uh, yeah, we can, we can debate whether it's a major operation, but there is a still a huge amount of destruction, hundreds of thousands of people displaced. Yeah, the death toll might be a little bit lower, but, but there's still a rising death toll. Does the, you know, this was supposed to be or I, I think was communicated as a way that the U.S. was, uh, you know, r restraining the Israelis from from committing more of the the, the worst kind of um, 
or creating the worst kind of images that we'd seen earlier on in the war and worsening the humanitarian situation. The humanitarian situation has got worse as a result of the operation. Yeah, maybe it falls short of, of some category for a major operation, but doesn't this basically what has happened is that they the, the, the Israel has gone ahead with what you almost what you were telling them not to. So it is a different operation uh, than what they were initially planning and is a different operation than the one that we were very much making clear we were opposed to. It's not to say that we have agreed with every tactic that they have pursued, that we have ever, uh, agreed with every strike uh, that they have taken. Of course, we can always look at things and say this isn't the right way to do this. You should have done more to minimize civilian casualties. But when we made clear what we were opposed to, we had a very specific operation uh, in mind. And what we saw ultimately did not look like that type of operation. But you're, and you're, you're talking about the, 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 the casualty figures coming down. So is there an acceptable level you know, 50 a day is okay, but no acceptable level is, is not acceptable okay. level is zero um, right. for civilian casualties. Now, you know, we want to see uh, militant casualties. Of course, is a very different thing. We want to see them prosecute the the campaign against Hamas, but we don't want to see any civilian casualties. Just two really quick yeah. questions on Israel. Um, there's a report that the the U.S. and Egypt are going to work on a high tech underground barrier to prevent smuggling of weapons from Egypt into Gaza, and they've told Israel that they will um, work on this effort is if there's a ceasefire and hostage agreement. Is that accurate? So I will answer that generally, which I know you you won't like. I'm not going to, to to confirm that or speak to that in detail. But we do believe that smuggling across the border from Egypt uh, uh, into Gaza was a very real problem that needed to be addressed. Um, it's one of the ways that Hamas was able to arm itself, that Hamas was able to fund itself, and that presented a legitimate security uh, challenge to the government of Israel, and it also makes it uh, difficult to ever achieve peace for the Palestinian people. If you see Hamas having the ability to arm itself and, and re-equip its and re, uh, reconstitute its terrorist infrastructure. So we have been working on proposals with the government of Egypt, with the government of Israel, on how you could address that challenge, but I'm not going to confirm uh, any the specifics of any one proposal. Okay, and you said it was a real problem. Is it no longer a real problem? It, so it was a. I was speaking to the pre-October seventh context. Sure, but um, you know this is uh, still presumably an issue. So Israel has control of that stretch of Gaza now, and I'm not going to give a definitive assessment that there's no smuggling coming in, but you've seen Rafa, you've seen the Rafa border crossing shut down completely, something we oppose, and you've seen Israel going in and shutting down smuggling tunnels. I can't tell you whether smuggling has been completely eliminated, uh, but certainly it's a different context now with Israel having control uh, of the Philadelphia border. Has the majority of smuggling been prohibited? I can't or? give you any kind of uh, okay. assessment. And then just one more on, on another... Um report with regard to Israel. The, over the weekend, there was um, a Hezbollah missile attack towards Israel. And uh, according to a local um, medical center, there was an American citizen who was injured. Is the State Department able to confirm that, give us any details on the status of that American citizen? Uh, I can confirm that there was an uh, American citizen who was injured in Israel, um, uh, one American citizen who was injured in Israel, but I can't um, uh, give you any details of the situation other than to say that we are monitoring the situation and are in contact with Israeli authorities. And are you in contact with this American citizen's family? And um, We are providing assistance to the U.S. citizen and their family. Okay. Um, go ahead. I'm going to do a few more around the room, then i got to go. Um, Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. There's a uh, heated debate going on in Pakistan regarding May 9th protest. Uh, last year, on 9th of May, uh, angry protesters of a political party attacked military installations, uh, uh, looting, vandalism, and arson report resulted in damage worth 1.9 billion rupees. It was kind of the same attack like January 6th on Capitol Hill. So what are your thoughts when you witness such kind of uh, attacks on states, institutions, so anywhere in the world, including Pakistan? So our thoughts are the same anywhere in the world, which is we support legitimate free expression, uh, including the right to protest, the right to, uh, to, for, to peaceful assembly. And we, close, we oppose violent, violent uh, actions. We impose vandalism, looting, arson. Um, that would be true anywhere in the world. And when it comes to um, uh, 
when it comes to responding to those situations, we urge um, all, first of all, we'd say all protests should be conducted peacefully and governments should um, deal with them consistent with the rule of law and respect for free speech. So Pakistani Defense Minister has said that Pakistan will continue launching attacks against terrorist groups in Afghanistan as a part of a new military uh, campaign. So does the U.S. support such strikes against terrorist groups like TDP in Afghanistan? So the Pakistani people have suffered greatly at the hands of terrorists. Uh, we have a shared interest in combating threats to regional security. Um, do you need directions, Matt? Is that, oh, okay. <laughs> Saeed, I would think you knew how to get to, to this location after all this time. I'm always looking for directions. For the, for the people making the transcript, who won't know what I'm talking about, of some Google Maps directions. I think, I think it's Google Maps directions went off in the middle, in the middle of the long. briefing. May have been Apple Maps. Not Matt Lee's, to, 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 to be very clear. Um, uh, we partner with a range of Pakistani civilian institutions and regularly engage the government of Pakistan to identify opportunities to build capacity and strengthen regional security, including at our annual high-level counterterrorism dialogue. Uh, Tom, go ahead, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap for the still up. I know, it's still, still Saeed. I wanted to ask you a question about Europe. Uh, the White yeah. House has announced this afternoon bilateral between the President and the new UK Prime Minister on Wednesday, and I know the Secretary has bilateral with uh, David Lammy, the Foreign Secretary. Um, when it comes to the UK and the European Union, I mean, it's been an extremely turbulent eight years, really, for the UK. Um, the uh, Obama administration, when the current President was Vice President, made no secret of what they thought about that referendum in the run-up to it. And I just wonder how you look at this, what you be thinking uh, when this UK delegation is here about the UK's place in Europe because it's strategically very important um, for the Europeans and for the US-European relationship. Do you see this as the start of a new chapter? How are you, how are you viewing this? So I don't think I'm going to comment on what a change in government might mean. That uh, is just always kind of places that, well, tip, I shouldn't say always, but typically don't go. I will say that no matter the government in the UK, uh, we have always had uh, an incredibly close uh, working relationship, a special relationship with the UK, and we expect that to continue under the new government. Um, but even with the UK not a member of the EU, when you look at the things that we have been working with Europe on under this administration, um, chiefly and uh, maybe most importantly, countering Russia's um, in invasion of, U of Ukraine, you have seen the US, the UK, and other members of Europe united and working together to uh, push back. And based on what we've heard from the new prime minister and the new foreign minister and other members of the, the uh, UK government, we do not expect that to change in any way. And what about a free trade ar arrangement, which the last government had been pursuing? Uh, is the US still interested in that with the UK? Let me take that one back and get to you. And with that, we'll wrap for today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.